let's, let's restart. All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, my name is Gerald. I am just recently graduated from NUS uh, Law and Econ's double degree. So uh, my base, I always go around introducing myself different ways at different conferences. Uh, when I speak to lawyers, I'm the law student that codes, that has a Econ's uh, side quest. When I speak to data people, I'm the coder who has a law side quest. So I know a little bit about, you know, uh, how the law works, a little bit about coding, and how I got into legal data and analytics was really just trying to combine what I learned from school, what my interests are, and you know what I thought that people are interested in nowadays. You know, you 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 put the word data and analytics, and then people will show up to a talk. So, um, you know, it's it's interesting because if you think about this, uh, when I was first getting interested into legal, you know, what they call AI and the analytics and all this, that was maybe three years ago. I was a law student, I just finished my core modules for law. So you learn very standard stuff, uh, tort law, criminal law. You, know. you don't learn any math, you don't learn any programming or anything. But then one, one day there was this article that comes out in the news. Um, and it says, well, according to your law society president, um, AI will replace all lawyers. <laughs> so, so you don't have a job when you graduate. So you know, and I was like, oh, I, I'm not going to have a job, so what, what do I do now? So, I'm like, okay, since I, 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 I like to code, I like to you know, do numbers and stuff, why don't you go f just go and find out what this is all about? And the more I found out what this is all about, the more I found myself interested in it. And it ended up in me trying to start this startup with a few of other guys in law school um, who are also interested in both the law side of things and also the programming side of things. So that's how I got into it. And uh, well, which one do you want, I guess? <laughs> do you want uh, data preparation, the big data era? Data-driven, uh, data technology and the future of play. This sounds nice. Okay, but why don't you just take a choice and okay. put the rest? It's okay. Uh, later you can. Later? Do. Okay. Sure. Right. So um, yeah, that was just the first slide. Just introduce myself and everybody else. So uh, well, like I was saying, we have a good mix of people in the room today. So uh, I'm just gonna get started on the program. Uh, just a few key questions that I want to cover. Um, actually, just two main ones because there's not enough time to cover everything. When uh, Telha and the organizers approached me, uh, law student and everything, lawyer, I, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to be in a room full of data people. So what do I have to offer? What what should I talk about that you know you guys already don't don't already know, or you know how can I value add to this meetup? And and my my thinking was simply just well maybe I can talk a little bit about the stuff I learned from law school. Uh, the domain knowledge and how it kind of shapes what we do at uh, le what we do when we I'm trying to do legal data analytics and at the startup that I run. Um, so anyone has been to law school minus the lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's actually one. Well done. Um, yeah. So first question that I want to try to ask is: Can data science be meaningfully applied to law? And um, I think the emphasis is really on meaningfully, because I mean we know that data science can apply to everything and what do I mean by meaningfully? Well, we'll explore that. Um, and law is interesting because it's one of these things where you deal with human lives and human rights every time. So you know, you decide a case, you you make an application. It's all trying to adjust or win over some rights on some other people, rights to you know the house, rights to some money, the right to do things, the right not to do things. <clears throat> and if data science were to be meaningfully applied to law, it needs to be able to do it in a way that sensitive to the, the nature of law itself, which is it's very important. People's lives will be changed. We can't just go in and, and you know, um, with a model that has questionable accuracy, reliability, and seek to you know, apply this all, all around. And it's questions of bias data and so on. So the second question I want to ask is, well, can data scientists and other professionals actually participate in this process? Do you have to be a lawyer to do legal data analytics? And I'm sure you can guess what my answer to that is. Um, I don't, probably don't have to say. So, since we're in the World Cup season, I thought I should start with a few qualifiers. So, what I'm going to present is just my view of a few things, what the law is. What the law is, is a question that has been debated by lawyers for a few centuries. So, there's no answer, but it's just one perspective. And, and how that really shapes what I think, why I think we can apply uh, data science to the law. Um, so, I'm going to just run through a few sub-arguments, basically, in the legal memo style. Uh, the, first, the first point I want to make is, yes, data science can be meaningfully applied to the law. 
And the first sub-point is that this is because the law is partly a data processing problem. So what do I mean by data processing problem? Uh, this is a common phrase that you hear around, that lawyers are throwing around nowadays. They will say code is law. So well, I, I have about one hour to explain to you what law is, and uh, I'm just going to go with a really simplified version. Uh, law, in a sense, is like code. You write some rules, and you try to shape some, you write some rules that try to have some real consequences on the world. Um, when it comes to code, you, know, you write certain rules and algorithms that achieve a certain goal. And it's just that law works in a more indirect, more uncertain, but in a sense, also a, a large, has a larger reach. So <coughs> some people I speak to use the analogy that the law is like the operating system of uh, society. And the people who work on it are like the you know, lawyers. You can think of them as working on a massive GitHub repository that's the common law, you know, or like the law. <coughs> so this is an example of a law. <laughs> I just taken this off the Penal Code website. Uh, it's a law that's on the criminal breach of trust. To it's just basically when you steal money. So if you followed the recent uh, events surrounding people in certain churches who have been charged with misappropriating money, this is the applicable section, uh, amongst other things. So just look at this long piece of thing that nobody really wants to read. Um, the first thing you notice at the top is this whole long chain of Boolean, all n, all n, all n, and then you know, it's, a, it's long and it's unclear, but there's a reason why it's unclear, because there needs to be some room that for lawyers to, you know, uh, the flexibility helps us deal with the edge cases, let me put it that way. And then there are the illustrations, not every statute has this, but these are like your test cases. So just a very simplified version of what the law is. Um, and now, you know, what do lawyers do? So this, I didn't make this myself. Uh, so quick, quick really introduction to what lawyers do. So, yeah, I mean, do you all know this guy? This guy is O.J. Simpson, very famous case. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so there are lots of uh, misconceptions about what lawyers do. Uh, um, some people think we are evil. Some people think we, we are like, uh, if you watch American television, uh, you know, we, we go around blackmailing people, getting what we want, wearing nice suits. Uh, yeah, but what we really do is, is really a mix of lots of data processing. There's a room full of documents. You go in and find out what's the, what's the most important document there. Where, where is the smoking gun in the whole room of documents that you can show that this particular company has committed a crime or you know, has breached the contract materially and so on. So what we really do, data processing. And that's why I say that the law is like a data processing problem. And if we look at really a simplified model of really, really simplified model of what lawyers do generally. And uh, we had the lawyers in the room, if you disagree, feel free to raise any objections. Um, you know. <laughs> go on, go on, go on, go on. Go on. Yes. The lawyer is not just a person who is doing data processing. It's also intermediary between people and law. Great, yeah. It's mostly the intermediary, you know? Yeah. Uh, usually after some time, you will have some experience and you know for sure um, how the case will be resolved. Yeah? yeah. You don't do that data processing anymore. You're just explaining and you're explaining your clients what will happen next. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that, that's true. So it's what? Not that creative, you know? Not that idealistic like you're talking. <laughs> yeah, um, you're, you're absolutely right. So that, that's why I, I had to put the word partly. It, it's just one small part of it. Uh, typically, the younger lawyers will do it. If you're more senior, then you become the API, the interface between clients. <laughs> And, and the law, but, but meanwhile, the people working on law, the database people, they are the young lawyers there. So, so, so yeah, lots of qualifiers since we're in the World Cup season, right? Um, simplistic model, it's, it's not accurate, all models are wrong. Uh, some models are useful, and this is probably, I hope it's useful. Very simplistic model, when, you, when would you sue someone? When your probability of winning times the amount won minus the fees that you incur, is, that's the net positive that you gain, the expected outcome. Uh, sorry, I'm a, I'm, I've been through econ training, that's why I'm saying this. Uh, so if I put this in math, something like this, probability of winning given the x is the, what the case is about, f is the legal fees, a is some function that determines how much you win if you win, and of course f is some function that determines, determines the legal fees that you pay. So just math fluff, really, just to make it more formalized. But 
uh, just a small point, we assume that the legal fees are fixed whether you win or lose, which lawyers will know is not true, but just for simplicity, let's just say so. Um, why, why am I talking about modeling this in terms of math? Um, well, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to this. So basically, a small part, a small part of what lawyers do is to advise on these two things. What's the chances of winning? How much will you win? And of course, in exchange for that, they charge you this, the cost. of, And there are other costs that you <coughs> incur uh, when you fight a legal case, of course. Right, um, so an important concept that lawyers will go through in year one of law school, these are the only two Latin words I will use today. Uh, it's pronounced stare decisis, I think. So I've, it's basically saying that when you have a common law system that, that we have in Singapore, the current case depends on what has been decided previously. So the quant in the room will know this as an autoregressive process. Okay, AR1, ARP, whatever. Um, so what it, what it means is that when, when, when you have a case, the lawyers will have to look through previous cases. And the previous cases are really, really important because if the previous case is the same and, and your case is the same, you have to decide the same way because it's of this concept of stereotypes. And I've taken an excerpt from a relatively famous uh, criminal breach of trust case. You don't have to read it, you don't have to understand it. Just look at the blue parts. Um, these are past cases that have been cited by the court in, in its reasoning in coming to its decision. So these are the past cases they look at. So in a sense, they're looking at the past data points. Of course, here there's only three. And uh, you would also notice that some of the cases are pretty old. Um, <coughs> yeah, oh, sorry. So this was a case decided this year. And a uh, very famous case, I don't have to say which one I think. Um, and they still have to look at, in theory, they still have to look at cases that were decided 40 years ago, 50 years ago, if it is similar enough to the present case. Of course, things may have changed and that will be part of the reasoning that they use. So I'm going through all of this stuff to just come to this uh, probably controversial equation. Probability of winning for case I is equal to some function of the past decisions that you've that have been made relative to, relevant to the case. Applicable law, in that case, are the facts of the case. So what do I mean? Um, if a case in the past is very similar to your current case, it becomes very, very important. It may, it may even be the case that, you know, just looking at that one, that one past data point, you would decide what happens in this present, present dispute. Uh, so the, the facts of the past cases are also important. The facts of your case is important. Facts of the past cases are important. Uh, procedure, which is how the case got here. Um, who sued who first? Um, whether there was any in interlocutory, basically intermediate applications. And who are parties involved? Who are the lawyers involved? Who are the judges involved? Are the lawyers like senior counsels? Or are the lawyers you know, not senior counsels? Um, and the most important thing, which statisticians will know the all important error term, which because we don't know what go goes on all the time. So there's an error term. So it's some function of all these things. And, and all these factors that goes into how decisions are made in the courts of law. And to power this decision-making process, which is one of the most important decision-making processes we make in society, it, lawyers look at the past cases. They look at what academics have written. Uh, they, look at, they look at a lot of factors to come into this decision. And, okay. So, uh, I'm just going to give you a real example. This is probably the most influential scatter plot ever plotted in uh, Singapore's history so far. It was plotted by the Supreme Court. I didn't plot this myself. Okay, the Supreme Court plotted this graph, uh, this scatter plot. Um, it was trying to answer this very simple question. How many years should I give in jail for this drug trafficker? Right? So common sense would tell you that the more drugs you traffic, in general, the longer you spend in jail, amongst other factors. So the Supreme Court plotted this graph. Uh, then there was this analysis that was made. <coughs> so don't have to read everything again. Basically, just look at the blue, the blue words. It's correlation between quantity of diamorphine and the length of the imprisonment imposed. However, such a correlation is weak. And, you know, it's somewhat weak. The correlation is somewhat weak. And the final sentence that was imposed is about eight years for trafficking 8.98 grams of diamorphine. So it's quite a lot of diamorphine, by the way. Uh, you can make a lot of people very sick with that amount. Um, so, 
taking a look at this graph again, I'm sure some of you are already wondering, so what is the correlation? Like, what is the number? Give me the numbers, right? So let's play a game. It's called Guess the Correlation. <laughs> let's play this game. How many of you have actually played this game? Like, it's a real game, I play it when I'm bored. Yeah, because I'm like that. Uh, so looking at this graph, what's the correlation that you think is the correct one? Just have a mental answer in your mind. Sorry? So who says, who says A? A, okay, a few figures. B? More. C? And D? <coughs> Two hands. Okay, three. Okay, right. So well, if you pick C, I know your statistician because C is the global most likely outcome, right, according to some studies. But actually, the answer is D. Uh, it's 0 0.81. Uh, according to, I fired up Jupiter and I got the numbers. Um, I also ran a very simple one variable regression. Uh, you know, it's significant and everything. So, so this is this is a correlation of 0 0.81. And and well, if you're wondering whether in the in the Supreme Court they looked at the correlation numbers, the answer is they didn't, uh, because numbers are not considered very important in currently in the judicial making process in the decision making process. Uh, but it's interesting to me because when I looked at looked at this law student. I'm like, okay, the judge is saying that correlation is weak. What's the correlation? Oh, it's 0.8. So is it weak or is it not weak? I, I, I'm a bit conflicted now because my econ side would say, oh, well, it's pretty strong, it's 0.8. You'd never get 0.8 in real life. But in, in the law, we would say it's a weak correlation. And, and I think I'm not really trying to say that the judge was wrong or anything. I'm just trying to say that you know, data can actually help. You can have some numbers to support your decision-making process when you are looking at something like that. So when you're, when you're thinking of, you know, what have the past cases been like and using that to decide the current case, you can actually use some data, uh, you know, data science concepts and skills. <coughs> so this was interesting because the, in that case, the prosecution, who is the authority that tries to get people in jail, okay, no, that's not fair. Um, they, they, they charge people, the police basically. Um, they were trying to argue that the sentence of the water was too low. And, and they went up to appeal and, and they were basically saying that, look, it's out of the line, it's out of line, it's too, it's too low, look at other cases. But the judge disagreed and said, you know, eight years is fine. Um, <coughs> so this brings me to my next point. Uh, first point is that law is partly a data processing problem. Second point, um, current methods of processing legal data are inefficient. Uh, I can get away with saying this now because there are not many lawyers in the room. <laughs> Plus, I think the times have sort of changed because if I said this three years ago, I would be excommunicated from the community and you're not allowed to practice law anymore or whatever. Um, but, but, but I think lawyers have increasingly seemed to acknowledge this issue. And the thing is that lawyers are really smart, really hardworking people. So, so, you know, it's not that people are lazy or anything. It's just the methods haven't kept up with the times for various reasons. Uh, so anybody know this? So this is from a famous TV show, um, Suits. And a general rule that I, I apply um, to explaining what law is about. Whatever is in, on American television, the opposite is true. <laughs> so why do I say it's inefficient? Do you, does anybody remember when this is from? This is actually from one of the early episodes. Um, I think episode four or five of season one. And, and, and this guy, an associate, for those who don't watch, he's like a young, just started lawyer who's like, you know, he has photographic memory. So he's like the protagonist with a hero in the story, right? And he, he somehow manages to get himself a job um, reading this whole room of documents or briefs to check for typographical errors, problems with it. So I would tell people that, you know, when they ask me whether Suits is realistic, I would tell them that, well, if Suits is realistic, this guy would still be reading these documents in season six in starting in season one, right? So not in, in the show, he did it in a day, so which was like, doesn't happen. So when I say inefficient, uh, you know, oh, this is, sorry, the comma there. Everything American television is, legal practice is not. That's go a good rule to go by. Um, so how do lawyers you know, do things like proofread documents? Well, they, they literally read them, so they read everything. <coughs> and if you talk about how do they do due diligence, um, Due diligence is this process where if a company wants to buy another company, he has to figure out whether he's worth, they're worth buying. So they have to look into their documents, you know, like, uh, have they done their shares properly? Have they, 
do, how many contracts do they have, what's their value of the assets, a lot of other things. And <coughs> well, what they would do, uh, now it's a lot better by the way, but what they used to do like 10 years ago is um, well, read all the documents. If, if the company had 200 subsidiaries who has operated for like uh, you know, 50 years, so that's 10,000 effective years of business, to read everything that, essentially everything, that, that the company has to offer, then they would, of course, charge the clients for it. That's the most important thing. So they read everything. Discovery is this process where you're, you're litigating from the other side, with the other side, and you want to know certain information um, that could help your case. So you ask them, can you please disclose this thing so that you know, we can find information to sue you on. As you can tell, that's probably not a very friendly exchange and they probably don't want to give you stuff. So what people would do is they would give you like a huge amount of documents, hoping that you wouldn't find anything. So they would just swarm you with documents and then you get your associates, look through these things, find me the smoking gun. So of course they would also read quite a lot of stuff. And some people look angry, are you lawyers? <laughs> so sorry, if, if, do really feel free to correct me because uh, I don't have time to go into the nuances. Um, so doing legal research, and another thing, um, really what people do is they would just read the cases manually and, and that's how it's done. But that's, that's really from maybe about 10 years ago. Uh, so it's not because lawyers are lazy or, you know, they're all really hardworking and really smart people. It's just that it's not the way it's taught in law school. So when it's taught in law school, what really it's taught is, well, you read everything because if you don't read anything, you'll fail your exams. Just read everything, don't be lazy. Be hardworking, read everything, and then you can pass your exams. So why, why, why is this the case in the legal industry? So some, some responses that you, know, you've, you always hear is, that, okay, we've always done it this way, or like numbers don't help, you can't reduce the law to an equation. You know. And um, th there's this really interesting article at 538. 538 is this uh, US poster, Nate Silver, if you've heard of him. So they have their own map plot like color scheme, <laughs> if some of you have used it. Um, and, and, some, and sometimes people would say certain, certain, certain things like, the only way to be 100% sure is if you read everything yourself, which is true. The, the thing is, all of this is actually true. Um, <clears throat> up to very recently, there weren't, the tech really wasn't reliable enough to do the kind of things that lawyers do to a degree of reliability that, that respected the needs of the legal industry. They respected the, needs, the, the, the reality that we are talking about real human lives and rights. So it was only you know, in the last five or six years when everybody started talking about AI and everybody started talking about data analytics that, and there was this explosion of techniques that was being used. Um, the attack really seemed to me at least to at least come up with a reasonable first cut. When, when I say first cut, it means that basically it means if, if, if lawyers have to make a decision, the tech will just browse everything and give them an like initial brief, after which the lawyers can make their own qualitative assessments. So there was this interesting uh, research that was done just, just like two weeks ago by a US startup. Uh, and the, I'm sorry for showing you a pie chart. It's not my pie chart, it's their pie chart. Um, yeah, they just found that basically the, the, the key finding is that lawyers miss cases and judges realize and this affects their clients' chances. So th this idea that you, know, you, you should manually do everything because manual is the only way to ensure that everything works, um, it doesn't work 100% as well. You, you miss cases and that, that makes it a problem. So of course this startup has their own interest because they, they offer like a legal research tool. Um, yeah, that's why they say this kind of things. But we don't do legal research, so <laughs> yeah. Um, so part of this reason is because there's this thing called the billable hours model. Uh, just to get into a bit, little bit about the commerce side of things. What this means is that you charge based on how many hours you spend. That's all. One hour, one dollar, two hours, two dollars. It's great, it's great. Yeah. You know, it's, it's how suits is. So you have high street officers, tailored suits, billable hours, great. No, imagine if like, you know, we did this in tech. If, if programmers did this, billable hours. Please note that your project cost will be directly proportional to the time complexity and the memory complexity of the code we write for you. The more complex it is, the more work we've done. <laughs> so the more you should pay us. So this is kind of like how weird it would be if we talk about it in uh, efficiency terms, which is I, I don't actually have an incentive to reduce the time complexity 
all the memory complexity of the algorithm because, well, I just want to get the hours. And any associate in the room, you have, an, you have a quota of hours to hit, right? You have a quota, right? <laughs> if you don't, what happens? Uh, let's leave you as that. Um, so there is some inefficiency, and the, the proposition really is, is quite simple. Data science can reduce it. It won't eradicate it. It will just make things a bit simpler. It can reduce it, the inefficiency. And so if I were to talk about a general problem that we have uh, from a data perspective, is when we have a document collection D, uh, this is just a customary <laughs> abbreviation, right? Capital D. Um, for each document, we want to see something like, is this document relevant? It's a classification problem. Is it, does this document contain something really specific, um, like a jurisdiction clause or a currency clause? So one of the famous examples in the, the legal industry nowadays is they will say, you know when Brexit happened? Brexit, the, the British pound fell dramatically, like 30% in a day or something like that. And, and Banks were like, oh no, what's my exposure to the pound? So they, they would ask the lawyers, what's my exposure to the pound? And the lawyers would say, oh, okay, give me about three months. I need to read through all your loan agreements and see what the currency of that loan agreement is. And they were like, what? No, we need it like in, in 20, 20 hours or something because it's, it's a live thing. For, foreign exchange is crazy. It's so fast. So you want to do something like a paragraph or sentence classification task. In, in the contract, look for the particular phrase that says it, this loan is denominated in British pounds or not in British pounds. So you're actually trying to extract some information. And, and this is, these are all things that people have done uh, using you no know, analytics and data science. Um, <clears throat> so what does the collection review about, you know, state of the law? Our opponents, uh, people are doing data mining on judges, data mining on their opposing counsel. It's like if you read the book called Moneyball, people are saying it's Moneyball for law. Uh, it's quite exaggerated sometimes, but this is what people are doing. So examples are like, you know, if you can cluster into specific threads of cases, lawyers will be very familiar with this. And you'll be like, oh, the common thread that runs through the cases, or there are a few different lines of cases that support different propositions. So it's sort of like a clustering problem. Um, <coughs> the data set that's involved is a huge data set. It's a natural language data set. There's, there's judgments, which I have shown you, contracts, affidavits, briefs, any, any legal document basically is a possible source of data. And, and I always go around telling people that, look, the law is probably the most important natural language corpus that, that we, we do in the world. And lawyers are the only ones right now working on it. Whether it's for the better or worse for society, you decide. Um, example is this. This is a case from a Singapore website. So I've just shown you the summary at the top. Um, <coughs> Yeah, this is a very big case, you see all the senior counsels are fighting. Uh, and it, it just gives you some information, who are involved. And at the bottom, there is the full judgment of the case. Uh, so you can just go to this website, singapore.law.sg, can't get it wrong. Um, and, and how we do data extraction, right? It's just as you expect, it's NLP, it's NLP and then there's more NLP. So NLP stands for Natural Language Processing for those who are not familiar, not not the commonly confused neurolingual programming thing that I don't really know what it's about. Uh, so both at my startup and, and in general, I think, uh, a mix of both conventional and AI methods are used. Uh, conventional, I mean regular expressions. Your basic string matching, conventional, not the stuff that you get millions of dollars to do, uh, but very important. And then there's AI methods like you know, uh, your back of words models, vector space models, there are 5,000 models now. Uh, they turn semantic analysis. I can, I can throw more keywords, yeah, try me. Yeah, so um, there's a long way to go in this, in the sense that we don't really know yet, as of now, how we could get computers to just extract the facts very reliably. It, it's a tough problem, and yeah, the, 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 thing, the thing is that, as you know, natural language, if those of you who work with natural language, um, there's so many different ways that the same thing can be expressed. And this is what keeps lawyers their job, actually. Because <laughs> you need a human at the end of the day to just kind of read through and make sure it's correct. Right? Uh, if you, you run TFIDF, you don't always know what you can, what you will get. You don't always know. Like, you, can't be, you can't know for sure. Um, and any experts in NLP, if you guys are here, please raise your hand. I'll go look for you after the talk. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so don't take it from me. There are lots of companies, mostly in the US, uh, that are looking at this stuff. So. Document review, in fact, contract review especially, 
Uh, K Stacks is the one that did the pie charts uh, previously. JP Morgan, of course, everybody knows what J what's JP Morgan. So they were one of the banks that came up with in house a system to read contracts for them to find out what the currency of the loan is. And then they proudly announced on the website, we have now saved 3,600, no, 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 uh, 360,000 hours that we used to, get to give to our lawyers <laughs> using the software that we have. So if you take 360,000 hours times the average hourly rate of a lawyer, which is like $500, that's the amount of money they're not paying lawyers anymore. It's, it's quite scary for me. Um, <clears throat> but they're doing this. And uh, due diligence, uh, there's a big firm that has recently moved into Singapore. They are quite good. Uh, Luminance is the name. They, they basically run um, NLP to try to look for stuff in due diligence doc documents. And you know, I've spoken to some lawyers who used it, and they were quite impressed because uh, they said it really helps them, first of all, and it really keeps the cost of the legal matter down. And one of them actually said, oh, I like this, I like this word cloud thing that they show me because it helps me you know, see what are the main threats in the documents. And I always tell him, like, you know, word cloud is what we do at level 1000. <laughs> and there's so many other things that you can do. But, but that, that's the thing, because even the most basic stuff, there's actually some value that could be, can be unlocked from, from that. If, if a word cloud helps, then, then it helps. You, know? you, don't, you don't have to always use the most complex things. And it's, it's really the case that, given the way the legal industry is, the most simpler stuff actually can really bring quite a lot of value to the industry. Um, discovery. Uh, there are a few companies as well. So they basically just throw all the documents into something. Lawyers, the lawyers would, are involved in the process. They will teach the AI or software you know, what kind of things they're looking for. They would tag an uh, initial training set of what they classify as relevant to the discovery and non-relevant to the discovery. And then I'm just guessing that they use some form of back office model. Um, the system we're just trying to find documents that are similar to those that are tag relevant. And not those that are like not relevant. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so for research, there are quite a few companies. Um, oh, you can just Google this legal tech landscape. <laughs> legal tech landscape. All of the, all the companies will be there. I've only taken like a selection. Um, yeah, uh, Ross, Revel, Lex Machina. Th these are companies. All these companies are from US, I think, because uh, I, I guess US is just more, I don't know, more accepting of this, this stuff. Uh, but research, so what these people do is essentially, if anybody has done semantic search, semantics, um, a mix of that, there's also question answering. So Ross is marketed as something based off IBM Watson. Uh, and you, the idea is that you type in a natural language question and like, what is the applicable law on bankruptcy? And the system will tell you, oh, the applicable law on bankruptcy is so and so forth. So it's powered by some NL, uh, NLP and some AI in the back end. So these are the companies that are doing it. So no, no, I'm, we are not the only guys, of course. Um, so, no, right. so this is the part where I'm supposed to show you what I've done, right? And uh, I have to preface this with a few, uh, again, qualifiers, because some things I can't share, otherwise my co-founders will kill me uh, as much as I want to tell you. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, this is like the, the bipolar disorder that I have between my lawyer side who says, protect everything, and the coders I would say share everything. Yeah, so a uh, very early prototype of what we've done. This one I can share because it's so early. Uh, you, you can probably know what it is straight away, but uh, this is CBT, uh, Criminal Breach of Trust, and money stolen is on the x-axis, years in jail, y-axis. The curve is just a simple uh, regression line, I think. So we look at the cases, extract some factors from the cases, and plot a regression line and scatter plot. So this is similar to what I've really shown you that the Supreme Court has plotted earlier. Um, so we were trying to use this to show lawyers that you know, this can actually work. So I remember it's, it's quite interesting because we spoke to a pretty senior lawyer and he asked me this question with, which was like, you know, why do I need regression analysis? Because if I have enough data, everything becomes normal, normally distributed. So let me just use a normal distribution. And then when I heard that, I was like, I just smiled and said, oh, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> There's no way I was going to change his mind anyway. Uh, it's just, th this kind of was just too far. But uh, this is an experiment that we did. Uh, and it, it's interesting because if you plug in, we, we tried plugging in the, the facts of the City Harvest case into the model, and it predicted a pretty high sentence. So a, a, a lot more than what the court gave. But this was, of course, not, not trained on the, the right data anyway, just, just for fun. 
Um, another thing that we did, so this is also CBD cases. Uh, this is more recently based on the data set that we have. Um, just to see the distribution of sentences. I mean, this is just all data visualization, right? Simple stuff, because I can't. Uh, first of all, it's because I'm trained in economics, so I always talk in graphs and charts. And um, secondly, because I can't talk too much about the, the, the modeling process. The modeling process. Um, right, uh, so in 2008, there was a comprehensive overhaul of the penal code. The maximum sentence for criminal breach of trust was increased from three years to seven years. So I wanted to see what, what happened when you increase the maximum sentence. And if you look at the graph, it, it actually says nothing. So it kind of makes sense, like increasing the maximum sentence doesn't by itself affect all the sentences after that. Um, so you can kind of see that you know, most people get pretty far on the low end of the spectrum. When the maximum is three years, they kind of get zero years anyway. Maximum is seven years, they still get zero years. Um, if you're wondering why there's this guy who's like getting six years, even though the maximum is three years in the pre-2008 era, it's because he, he did it twice. <laughs> And the judge said, you, you, you serve consecutively, so you get six years. Yeah. <coughs> so that's how it works. Um, yeah, so another, another thing, um, there's this interesting trend in the, in the courts that they're trying to talk about sentencing people based on, in their words, principal factual components. Principal factual components of their offense. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, principal components, <laughs> okay. So uh, yes, principal components analysis. Uh, they were trying to reduce the facts of the, the offense, you know, how much money you steal. Uh, you know, did you plead guilty? Did you commit some violent, uh, were you very violent in the process of doing this crime? Uh, how many times did you do it? So all of these factors, reduce them into certain principal axes and, and use that as a guide to how to sentence the person, how many years this person should get. So based on the data set that we've already did previously like this, I, I manually, this wasn't PCA, but uh, I manually reduced this based on uh, kind of a roughly put together index of what factors go towards axis one, what factors go towards axis two, and then I plotted this out. And it seems to kind of work, because you know, when you are high on both, you also get a high sentence. And when you're low on both, you kind of get a low sentence. But of course there's some, it isn't so neat as the data that you always see on blog posts, which is like you can draw a perfect circle around each, around each cluster. Right, um, so this is something else that I was doing for um, re academic research. Um, heat map, typical heat map. Um, the x, y axis is the, in a sense, the judge. So each row is a judge. One judge, one person. X axis is the year. And how green it is on the left side is how often the plaintiff, the complainant, before this person wins the case. And of course, how blue is it on the right side is how often, how many cases this person has decided. So um, I was just curious to see whether there was any like, you know, clear trends of people who are like, all the time they're green, uh, one person here. And there are some people who are all the time red, so all here. And, and this tells you that basically, based on a two-dimensional correlation over time and over person, uh, some people, you usually would lose if you go in front of this person. Usually, if you go in front of somebody else, you will win. Of course, this is uh, something that uh, could be quite controversial, I know. Uh, people in the UK are doing this. There's a firm in the UK that goes around saying, we have the best data on lawyers. If you consult us, we'll tell you which lawyer to pick, because this lawyer always wins, wins in front of this judge, and you, your chances are great. Uh, I don't believe in that, because I've, I've gone through legal training. I don't, I don't really, I'm not going to tell you that, no, you look at this heat map, you can choose the best lawyers. It's not the case, because it all depends on well, sometimes the lawyers will get lousy cases, or the judge will just happen to you know, be assigned all the cases where the complainants have clearly stronger cases. So this was just one of the intermediate steps that I took uh, in the research to kind of have a rough sense. And then after that, I, was, I applied this and I put in some controls. Uh, controls. Do I need to explain what controls are? No, right. So I put in some controls for you know, uh, facts of the case and tried to see whether I could isolate the the, the, the impact of just the, the judge, the impact of the judge alone, when you control for the facts of the cases, control for circumstances of the cases, is there still a significant correlation? And um, according to the numbers, there, there wasn't. Only a few, one or two people out of like 500 had significantly different chances for complainants uh, than, than, the other, than the other judges. So it means basically 
that the judges are quite neutral. Very good. Yeah, because if it was the other way around, I wouldn't be able to publish it. No, just kidding. <coughs> so uh, another thing that we were, do, we were doing, um, this is this is to do with divorce. Um, although the although the courts always say that you can't reduce the law to an equation, uh, well, in in the, in the area of divorce, there's one thing that they've applied a very mathematical framework to, which is when you divorce, you need to split your assets. Okay, hopefully not, nobody has to go through this, but you need to split your assets because it used to be one part, one whole, and now you've got to split them into basically two parts. And the court has to decide what is a fair division. Do I give husband 40% and wife 60%? Do I give husband 60% and wife 40%? So this is a division, and basically they're calculating a ratio. Uh, so we looked at all the publicly available past cases of divorces and what the judges have said in splitting the assets. And, and then we plotted some data. This is just a selection of the data. Uh, the direct ratio refers to how much monetary, how much money you put into the marriage. So if, yeah, the, let's say the main asset is your house, it's worth $1 million, you pay 500000 your spouse pays 500000 it's a 50-50 direct ratio, for example. Uh, indirect ratio is the intangible stuff. So if you take care of the kids more, you get 60%. If you do the housework, you get more. Um, if you are irresponsible, criminal, you get less. So that's the intangible part. So they were kind of, they are, they are really trying to reduce it to a number actually. So, and then they will take the average of these two numbers. And if they need to, they will adjust further. And they will find the ultimate division that um, they think is right for you. Um, so the, the numbers here are expressed in terms of the husband's share. So let's say 1.0, it means that the husband was found to have contributed 100%, 100% of the money. So you can kind of see very quickly that based on this, there are set of litigated divorces. We are quite in a skewed <laughs> situation when husbands tend to contribute more of the money. But when it comes to the contributing to the household, it's equal. And in fact, the, it tends to be that the wives contribute more to the household. So pretty stereotypical Asian kind of setup. Uh, and this is shown in the cases. Um, interesting, yeah. So, so this was part of the data that we crunched to come out of this thing that the courts are referring to as the outcome simulator. So, because they don't want to use the word prediction, they want to say, I'm going to simulate your outcome. I'm not going to predict the outcome, I'm going to simulate your outcome. And, and um, this is the front end, how it looks. Um, basically, you go to, there's a model behind this. You go to the app, you enter in some facts about your, your, your marriage that we have found that courts tend to deem as relevant. And then at the end of the day, it gives you just a simulation. Of course, the, the exact model uh, I can't share, but let me just say that we follow established data science practices and methods and algorithms. Um, and it gives you the predicted ratios, the simulated ratios. Um, so here are some of the challenges that, you know, from doing all this stuff, I kind of think about, which I, I'm not sure whether it's the same for all types of data science because I really only look at legal data sets. Um, there isn't enough data. I'm, I'm sure this is probably the same. Uh, you <laughs> typically have like a <coughs> few hundreds in Singapore. Oh yeah, so this comic is, is from everybody's favorite, XKCD. Uh, yeah, dangers of extrapolation. So th that's a big problem, as you all know, because at the start I said that you really want to be sure. You can't just extrapolate and, and then we say, oh, you know, uh, you get less money for your, from your marriage because based on 25 data points. You, know, you can't just do that. And, and there isn't enough public data. There's a lot of data, actually, because there's 6,000 divorces that go through the courts every year. And that's just the non-Muslim divorces. Um, <coughs> but only, out of that, only about less than 1% actually get published. Publish. Of course, it's, there are reasons why, obviously. You can't just publish everybody's divorce matters. Uh, unless you anonymize them, of course. But I guess this is the other the other problem, which is data was collected in the time before data science. You know, we, it's collected in terms of in handwritten forms. Uh, sometimes a lot of data that we have in the law is not even digitized yet, or, either that or it's, it's scanned, but not OCR. The, 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 there was a big push in the last 20 years to just get law firms to digitize their stuff. And even then, there was a big fight, you know, oh, I need my hard copy because I, I, I learned better that way. And it, it, it's also true. So, there was a big fight, and there's still a big fight going on at the digitization phase. And if it's not digital, we can't do anything <laughs> from a data science perspective, right? 
Uh, and of course, there are all these typos. It's annoying. I will run all my code, and then it will crash for some reason because there's a typo that I assume wasn't there, and I have to go and rerun the whole pipeline. Uh, and it, it's especially a case when it comes to names. Because you know, when you talk about, let's say I'm processing lawyers' names, the same lawyer has 10 different names in the database. Because like, if, for example, sometimes Indian names has, have the son of S slash O, and some people write it as S, S dot O dot. Some people will write it as S O without any slash or whatever. So you know, I mean, of course, you could just scrub the punctuation off and everything. But sometimes you are trying to code fast and you don't really realize these things happen. Yeah, so it's not very clean. Uh, another thing which is probably unique to the legal sector is that lawyers can reasonably disagree on anything. So when your definitions are not set, your data definitions are not clear, you can't just, it, it becomes difficult to get data that people agree on. So a simple example is, I, we were trying to look at word count. <laughs> like, has the average word count of certain types of legal documents, like judgments that judges write, gone up over the years? Simple as that. Then we were talking about, oh, what, is, what words do we count in the judgment? Do paragraph numbers count? Um, do headings count? Do quotes count? Do appendices count? And, and all of these things, like if, if the citation of a case has dots, is it one letter, one word, or the whole thing, one word? And then, you know, you can fight about this. And if, you don't, if we don't get to, if we don't have a final say, the lawyers can fight about this to essentially no end. And the problem is they're right. So you can't just say, I veto your decision as the data scientist and say, I just want to have this count. Even though you try to tell them, oh, you know, as long as it's consistent, the error is consistent across, it's kind of the same, not that important. But, you know, they still want, uh, for valid reasons, to have the exact count. And it becomes a problem even for word count. And another, <coughs> another place where the uh, disagreements occur is on the outcome. So if you're trying to predict the outcome of a case, lawyers will tell you, but, but it's not just a binary thing. It's, it's sometimes it's like a half-half. Sometimes it's, there are five different levels of, you know, is it a complete win, a total win, uh, you know, a very complete win? Did we win on both liability and quantum? Did we also win on cost? Uh, there, there's these, all these shades of winning and losing that, that is not very clear. In, in, in law. And sometimes, for example, in a criminal case, if you, if you are, uh, you know, your client is found guilty, but you've reduced the sentence, that's also a win. And that's very valid. So it becomes a question of definitions, and it becomes something that you have to really work with the legal team and you have to talk, talk, talk to them about it and understand what is going on. <coughs> so some data related problems. Uh, imbalance. I'm working on a data set now. The, the, the positive rate is like 1%, less than 1%. Imbalance. So as you know, sometimes when it's in balance, you have all these other problems that come up. The, the, you have to do all these countermeasures, which are quite annoying. Um, conflicting data. So some cases are just wrong. Uh, and the courts will say this, like, this previous case I find to be wrong. Henceforth, no one shall follow it. Yeah, and sometimes it's post facto, which is only after like 10 years they will say it's wrong. And that's because social values have changed and so on. And high velocity, the law keeps changing. That's what keeps lawyers at their job. You know, if it's fixed, nobody will have a job because it's just the same. You learn it once and it doesn't move. But it keeps changing, so your models have to change as well. That's another challenge. Um, and yeah, there's there aren't enough people working on this area. So uh, it's really, really niche area because people have the misconception that you need to know the law. You don't actually have to. It helps, of course. But knowing the data is really good enough. Uh, yeah, so there's, no, there's nobody. <laughs> so I leave it blank. So this is my last point. You know, other professions, you can help. So this is the famous Venn diagram for data science. Um, you know, there, there are three skills. And it's not possible to learn all of them. Trust me, I've tried very hard. And, and no, I don't know all of them. Uh, the lawyers are here, substantive expertise. Hackers, engineers, you are here. And the quants are here. Um, <clears throat> and one thing the lawyers really need help with is the math and also the code. Because if you do this on Google, <laughs> autocomplete, you actually see this. I did this about two days ago. Uh, you see the World Cup is there. I just, what are lawyers bad at? And math comes out. It just comes out. Like, OK, I, I'm, I'm aware that we are at Microsoft. So I tried this on Bing. But it, it didn't come out. So maybe Bing is more sympathetic to lawyers. Um, <coughs> and don't ask me about the second one. I have no idea. I make no comment. <laughs> I make no comment on that. Um, I think they're really good. So maybe I have no idea. 
And there are really these big open questions that we, we need data scientists and you know, AI researchers to come in to help us answer. I, I don't know the answers to any of this. Like, how do we get the facts or you know, applicable law, interesting parts of things from the text itself? Is there a way to do it? Is there, you know, can you just throw everything into a LSTM with attention and everything? Or, I don't even know what that is, by the way. Um, how do we deal with missing data? There's a lot of missing data. Uh, do you impute them? There's all these techniques. Um, data synthesis. So, you know, the famous example, there's a cat. You flip it around, it's still a cat. You rotate it, it's still a cat. You can use these five different cat photos to train the cat classifier. But if I have a case, and then I, maybe I tweak it a little bit using some vector math, is it still the same case? Is it a legit way of doing data synthesis? I, I don't know. Like, I'm just trying to see whether I can, it works if I, if I try it out. Um, <coughs> architecture, um, this is deep stuff. So yeah, are there models that are better for legal purposes? Maybe they are better reflective of how lawyers think. Just, a, just, a, just an idea. You know? now, for NLP, everybody knows you just use an LSTM. For some reason, it works. You know, for, for image use and CNN. I'm kidding, of course. There's a lot more nuances to that. Interpretability. Um, the judges, the lawyers, always want interpretation. And that's important. Because if you want to change someone's life, you've got to explain it to them. That's, that's the reason. So it has to be interpretable. But you can't just, you know, all, most of the stuff that we have is black box. Quite black boxy. You, know, you can't just neural network into neural network into XGBoost and then, okay, here, here's the outcome. <coughs> it's not going to work that way. Um, <coughs> And finally, the most hard question really is the human system. How do we imbue uh, data science culture into an industry that's really led by qualitative thinkers, i.e. lawyers? They think qualitatively, very complicated, very deep qualitative thinking, but still not quantitative by nature. Um, so the point is really that interdisciplinary partnership they work. This was a very famous paper published two years ago. Uh, very ambitious title. Uh, the, the authors, some guy from Amazon, computer science is a lawyer, psychologist. So There's this whole bunch of interdisciplinary people working together to create something that predicts what the European Court of Human Rights will say, using NLP, for example. Um, and it was interesting because when this came out, the press reported this in a very interesting way. You'll see this is what the press said. Oh, yay, uh, artificial intelligence judge developed by UCL computer scientists. Oh, all judges will henceforth be replaced. Uh, you know, and let me tell you what they did. All right? they, they took about 600 cases, uh, ran a vector space model. So they took, uh, I think, n-gram features, so one hot encoding, n-gram 1 to 4. Uh, then they did TF-IDF. And then they reduced it using spectral clustering, basically LSA, your latent semantic analysis, in the topics, fed the n-gram features and also the topics into an SVM, linear SVM, did some grid search, 79% accuracy, published. AI will replace all judges. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, read the paper. So, so this is the kind of uh, work that's being done. And, and it's not, I'm not trying to make fun of it at all. I'm saying that it's a, it's a field that's so new, so full of opportunity that if you just did something simple, you could still be world class. You could still be leading the field in that because there's nobody else doing it. And, and this, it's just really new. Um, so the, the last point is really, that there is a really big problem that can be solved here. So I couldn't get data on Singapore. So I just got this um, data on the US legal market. It's 437 billion US dollars in 2016. I can't give you 2017 because that's behind a paywall. Yeah. $6,000 for a report. Crazy. Um, and, and that's just how big the legal market is. And we haven't even included those that can't afford the lawyers. You know, how many of you have ever paid a lawyer to do something for yourself? Not for a parent, not for a spouse. For yourself, just for yourself. There's this one, there's, there's one, there's one out of about, oh, there's two. So two out of about 50. So, so why haven't you, okay, maybe I shouldn't ask that question that way. But you, you know it's not the cheapest thing to ever buy, you know. Um, and some, some, for some people, it's just something they can never afford. So if we do some quick math, you know, if we, I took the median income. So this is an economist thing, but median income of a, Singaporean, about 3,800. Uh, you take away 50% on Wi-Fi taxes and other stuff that you have to pay. You know, you divide it by 200 hours a month. So you get, you're basically earning nine, $10 a month, $10 a month, uh, $10 an hour, effectively. And the average lawyer bills $300 an hour. Um, and I'm, 
I, I'm sure a lot of us will agree with me. This is a conservative estimate, <laughs> right, right, right? Any objections? Three hundred dollars. So if we just divide this three hundred dollars an hour with ten dollars an hour that you make, you have to work, you have to work thirty, uh, more than thirty hours, to afford one hour of a lawyer's time. That's that's how it is nowadays, and that's not even including the other court fees you gotta pay, the other costs you got to, you know, food for, printing and other stuff. And if you lose, you've got to pay some of the costs as well for the other side. So it's, it's a big problem and it's known in the legal industry as an access to justice problem and access to legal services. People can't access the legal services. Most people can't afford a lawyer, that's a fact. Um, and, and you've asked the lawyers as well, they will tell you that if you don't have a lawyer, your chances are really seriously affected. It's not as if you can just go to court and then you just win. <laughs> you know, uh, if, if somebody has, for example, if you're getting sued in bankruptcy court, the banks will have a, you know, big firm lawyer and you'll just be there and you'll be like, oh, what do I do? <laughs> and even if you have a great case, your chances are, are affected. Of course, the lawyers will say this because they want you to engage them. Um, so this is really a big problem that, that is tied to that, that what I really said at the start. It has to be meaningful. And the meaningfulness for, for me and why we do this is really because, you know, if data science can reduce the legal inefficiencies, people will have better lives. You have access to justice. It's, it's a thing that um, is slowly trying to gain, it's slowly gaining uh, traction. Um, in the UK, this 17 year old came out with a chatbot that helps people appeal parking tickets. <laughs> and and, and like, he claims that 300,000 people have not paid their parking tickets because of that. Something like that. Um, and yeah, to recap what I've said, the first point is that data science can be meaningfully applied to law. So, partly, it's a data processing problem. Uh, and the current methods are not totally the most efficient thing. I mean, I'm very interested in efficiency as an economist. I want to make people better off without making anyone worse off, not even lawyers. Uh, data science can reduce the inefficiency to some extent. Not, not completely, uh, for sure, but to some extent. And you can help if, as a data scientist. If you're interested in this thing, you can actually just go pick up some legal stuff. Run your own thing. There's more problems than people working on them. So, you know, we welcome, in a sense, competition, but you know, this is a big problem that we can solve. We're uh, using data in the law. Yeah, lawyers need help with the math, interdisciplinary partnerships, and there's a big problem for us to solve. All right, so uh, I'm going to end here. Any, any questions? Because I have, I have books to give out. Because if you don't get them, I will keep them. Right? I will keep them, right? It's okay. <laughs> uh, any questions for me? Any, yes, anyone? Yeah. So you spoke about techniques like bag of words or DFID, which are generally context independent, right? But in a legal case or legal uh, scenario, context is very important. Yes. So do you have any pre-trained word embeddings for legal purposes? Which um, you use correctly or? Good question. So I need to repeat your question for the recording. So the question is, uh, no, in, in using vector space models like TFIDF, uh, word embeddings, context is very important. And in the legal, in the legal context, indeed legal uh, context is also very important. So do we have any pre-trained models um, for, for, for legal users? The answer is not that I'm aware of. Like uh, internally in, in my startup, we have some simple version of it, pre-trained, but there's no you know, glove or word to vec that's already pre-trained for you to use and just plug and play into your application. I'm still waiting for somebody to come out with it. If you can come out with it, let me know. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's always on news. Like it's always on like twenty news groups or something, and and you know it's not hundred percent applicable. So that's why uh, we have to make some extra effort every time. Yeah. Okay. You want, what do you want? <laughs> I'll collect it after at the end. Yeah. So any other questions? There was another one. Yes. Uh, so just how you show some charts about some of the research you did, right? Uh, yeah. The, the one of the CBD cases. And yeah. Number years. So for that particular one, how how do you gather the data and how do you like charts go into those? Um, uh, okay. So do you do it manually or do you, are you already using NLP or something like that? A mix of both. Like I, I'll be lying if I say I did everything automatically because the state of the art, as far as I know, doesn't go that far anyway. Um, so it's a mix of, like I said, both conventional methods like regex and uh, even just passing, uh, you know, HTML passing, and also some NLP involved. But uh, I'm not like the foremost expert in NLP, so th I would just say that there's more manual than automated. automated. Also because we want to be sure. There's no training set that we can try on right now. So right now, the manual part serves as a training set for future stuff. Yep.
定呃温床，有没有？有放的啥的？有说莫看高，对不？我的那有无说莫的一个啥的？ Oh, um, right. So the company, four of us are from law school. Uh, three of us have graduated already. I've just graduated, but um, it's it's kind of like a mix. So we we take the event event pretty seriously, pretty literally. So amongst the four of us, it's a guy with law and CS, it's a guy with law and business. I'm the law and econs guy, and there's some guy who's like law and he codes on the side. So it's we have a mix of skills. Yeah. And uh, to repeat the question, he's asking right now. We have a mix of skills in the startup. And I said yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. You talk about law, some of this work giving people more access, legal access. Um, can you see a position where it will actually create a bigger divide? OK. So uh, he asked whether there's a chance for um, Legal tech, basically, to in legal data science to create a bigger divide, and the answer is it's possible. Like any technology, it's just a tool. How we use it is a different question altogether. <coughs> so you know, if 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 it happens that the tech is being used by the big companies to you know size up who they're going going up against more so than the small little guys, then of course it will, it would be be oppressive. So it's it's really a question more of the human side of things than the tech side of things. The, the computer, as far as I know, there's no AI that knows good and bad right now. <laughs> so it will just do whatever it's told to do, right? right. Am I wrong? <laughs> I look like, you look like, uh, yeah. Are there so in buying houses, for instance, in, in the UK, we have conveyances who do what lawyers used to do. So mm. we kind of a step down. Is there a position where we're going to have legal tech making very cheap? Law accessible to people not involved in law. That's, that's uh, the question is whether legal tech can make uh, law cheap and accessible. Um, the question is, I mean, I mean, my answer is it's it's what I hope will happen. So it, in fact, in a sense, it's already happening. There are all of these uh, what they call access to justice push, access to justice hackathons. So people will come out of these apps that are like, um, you know, essentially most of them are chatbots. I don't know why, but chatbots. And anybody can just go on and ask a few questions about, oh, you know, I have this problem. And chatbot will say, oh, what, what's your problem? It's a housing problem. Oh, what, where do you live and all this? And then, and then the chatbot will kind of just triage what the problems are and, and direct them to the right authorities. In some cases, it's just the authorities already, not lawyers. So this is happening. And um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> It's just not at a widespread scale yet. But um, something about the economics of the law industry recently is that not just the people who can't afford it, but even the people who can afford it, they are pretending that they can't afford it. <laughs> so they're trying to tell lawyers, can you please lower your cost? Uh, and so there's a huge pressure on, on lawyers everywhere to, you know, there's like basically a price war uh, sometimes. And everybody's trying to look at ways to reduce costs. So it would, in my opinion, it, all it would take is for a big law firm you know, your, your magic circle, Slaughter and me, suddenly realize that with the technology, they can service the lower sections of the, of the income, uh, income, what do you call it, in, income classes, the income brackets. And, and maybe you would see, in 10 years time, big name firms actually using technology to service the masses. It's possible. Yeah, and it's kind of the standard theory of how, you know, disruption works by undercutting the current players at the mass market level. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Uh, so you mentioned like the cat, right? So cat is very under rotation. Um, you can use, like, generate more data points. Yeah. Um, so it definitely seems like you need more data, right? So you talked about trying the techniques. So you, like, what have you done so far, or what are you thinking about doing? What have I done? Um, well, nothing. So <laughs> I've been reading the papers. So I haven't had a chance to try it out because all of these are like uh, research questions. And, and I spend my time working on stuff that I'm being paid to do. <laughs> so th they are usually not in the same direction. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's always at the back of my mind. Like if I had more data, I could probably do some, a lot more things. Uh, what I've tried to do, yeah, I've just read the papers on data synthesis, Googled around. <laughs> yeah, not, not much, honestly. I'm just one guy. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Oh, well, you think of the biggest effect, like technology in general, uh, 
or like information systems or the infrastructure that is available. Okay. Do you have any comments on how the like, legal industries like technology infra is right now? Like, is there anything that should be done? Okay, so the question is, do I have any comments on uh, the technology infrastructure in the legal sector? And beyond just data science, and is there anything that should be done? Um, I'm going to give you a biased answer. I'm saying everything should be done. <laughs> so, like I said, um, you know, stuff are not digitized. Some stuff is still in, in hard copy. You, if you go to the state courts, I hope you don't have to go there, but if you go there, you'll be given a hard copy form. Uh, and, and then you will submit it somewhere. But so in, in Singapore, we are quite forward in this area, quite fortunately. Um, the courts are quite forward in adopting this new system called the e-litigation system. It's revolutionary, but the idea is just really we file documents electronically. But, but think about it, it's, it's actually a huge challenge because the level of reliability that's required in litigation is, is, is very high. It's, you can't just have a simple system that's open to tampering. You have to have a really robust one. Uh, so that's one thing, just filing stuff online. There's a lot of, beyond the other science, there's a lot of other, it's just very simple automation processes that are actually being applied. Um, to, to the legal industry now. Lots of people are looking at it. So uh, if you fill in forms, right, you all know that you can just write a very simple script that fills in the form, put in some placeholder, there's a template, fill in the form. It, it, this could have been done 50 years ago, but, but now it's people are looking at it because, and it's because it's an economic incentive. People are asking for cheaper stuff. So people have no choice but to come out with all these templates. Uh, beyond that, everything else is, more or less related to data science because of the fact that you, you kind of need something more advanced than Boolean logic to deal with the nuances of the, of the law. Um, quite, quite usually. La. So even simple stuff like you know, reading contracts, for example, you, you can't just have a mega regex that catches all the different ways it's expressed. You, know, you can't just do that uh, unless you spend like a million years reading all the contracts. If, if that's the case, why don't you just tag them yourself? Um, so most of the other stuff I know of, there's some form of machine learning inside, some form of NLP that, that tries to address for the uncertainties in the legal industry. Yep. Yeah, sure. <laughs> ah, blockchain. <sighs> no, no, blockchain is interesting because when you say blockchain, right, like lawyers get jittery because they've been told 5,000 times that blockchain will disintermediate everything and, and lawyers are intermediaries, so lawyers will be eradicated by blockchain, right? Uh, I, I don't currently see a clear path to that. To me, I don't know much, much about blockchain, honestly, because I spend more time looking at this stuff, data science stuff. Um, blockchain is just a data structure to me, and, and it's just a very special type of data structure that holds things in a certain way. So when you need a good data structure that has that requirements, um, you use blockchain. And one of the requirements, one of the things that lawyers are saying you can use blockchain for in the legal industry is um, logistics. So whenever you ship stuff, all of you have shipped ship stuff before, right, via Amazon or whatever, there is this contract of sorts called the bill of lading that, that you sign or somebody signs for on your behalf. And it, I'm getting it kind of wrong, but if streaming lawyers, please forgive me. Um, Apparently, there's this whole ecosystem around uh, tracking where your goods are on the ship, and you need to verify that you know, the person who claims the good at the disembarkation port is the true owner of the person who, who is the true recipient of what was shipped across. La. And, and you have to verify, and there's a lot of this uh, integrity in the system kind of thing. So they are looking at using blockchain for that. There's a lot of talk about that. I've attended three conferences where I talk about, oh, blockchain bills of dating, I've not seen it being done. Uh, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I don't know enough blockchain, about blockchain to say, but uh, it's the talk. That theoretically, it's supposed to replace everybody, just like AI. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but technically, like, you talk about blockchain, it's mainly if you have to move the electronic contracts yeah. okay. over the fact that you're trying to analyze the, or the or documents or the text that has already been assisted. Uh, can you repeat your? Uh, I mean, okay. You you talk about when you talk about blockchain, that, that means it's about something about future when you try to move into uh, electronic contracts, <coughs> and it's yeah. not about 
uh, handling those uh, documents that really appeared. Oh, okay, the new contracts. Yes. So, so your question is, can we use blockchain for the new stuff, the future stuff? Yes. Uh, over uh, like, like old stuff maybe <coughs> like turn turn it blockchain. I, I haven't really thought about it. Um, I I haven't thought about it myself. I, I don't know. <laughs> but, but what I hear people are doing, they just talk about smart contracts. So Ethereum smart contracts. Uh, you know, lawyers will tell you that smart contracts are not real contracts. By the way, um, <coughs> I, I tried to quote a smart contract like solidity and everything. And there were so many restrictions. I can't do. You can't do everything that you can. In like Python, right? You 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 have so all these restrictions, and and I think the the the, the blockchain tech needs to advance a bit further, at least to me, before it can be used for <coughs> full contracts, like the kind of contracts you see, three hundred pages software license agreement, M and A sale and purchase <coughs> agreement. Uh, currently, I think blockchain has a very few few functionalities that can replicate what contracts do, but maybe only about 20 percent of the simpler stuff. So for future contracts, uh, I think the tech probably needs to go a bit further. Yeah. This is what I think, based on what little I know. I don't know about blockchain. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm sitting down, but you can still ask. <laughs> no? So uh, do I get to stop? All right. Yeah, thanks for coming so much. Thanks so much. Uh, really, really happy to be here. So um, this this is this is serious, uh. If you know any of the answers, please look for. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, have a nice uh, week and uh, yeah, go and quote some legal stuff. Like I really hope that more people can get interested in this. <laughs>